on Boston. And I want to introduce the discussion in the following way, uh, which is to, to you know, I, I put the I put on the whiteboard the other day the, the spectrum of possibilities from, from the nation to the international, from the state to the international to the global. And in that spectrum, and in that spectrum, I pointed out that, of course, you know, moving from one to the other is actually a very complex process. So moving forwards towards cosmopolitanism, towards the global, and then moving from the global to the international and to the national conflict. So this has to do with the way in which polities have historically been organized uh, in the modern period into nation states, but also the segmentations of the world into different kinds of categories and how we, how we treat others, how we distinguish ourselves from others, how identity identities are constructed, collective identities are constructed in context of, context of differentiation between oneself and the other. This can be ethnic, religious, national, whatever. Uh, there are all kinds of segmentations. And one of the problems that I've consistently faced <coughs> intellectually, is that how, you know, if we have an abstract, for example, a Kantian, an abstract concept of cosmopolitanism, Kant starts from, from a categorical imperative, huh? or a series of categorical imperatives. And we saw this in the little seminar that we held here the other day on education, cosmopolitanism in education. Is a, Kant starts from an abstract understanding of these categorical imperatives that are internalized as moral categories of judgment that then lead to action. Moral categories that all rational individuals thinking about the same categories of problems can come to all together and therefore together arrive at common ends. But you need institutions, shapes, to make that possible. How do we move from the abstract to the concrete? How do we move from, from uh, an abstract cosmopolitanism, which is not the same thing as globalism, huh? An abstract cosmopolitanism that asserts, rightly so, that all human beings are of equal moral worth, and that assumes that that principle is the foundational principle on which we must eventually act. Hmm? to the actual implementation of cosmopolitan purposes. And one of the most, probably one of the most uh, productive perspectives, I think, that has been developed in this regard is the one that Zona Zaric is going to be talking about today, which is the capabilities approach. First elaborated by Amartya Sen. Maybe you were right in my writing, it's so bad. I'm also lazy. Thank you so much. So first elaborated by Amartya Sen, the Nobel Prize winning economist, but also political and moral philosopher, who's had an enormous impact, actually an enormous impact on contemporary thinking about development, about freedom, about the question, the questions, the fundamental questions of our age. And he published a a very important book back in 1999 called Development as Freedom, which has served as the foundation for his later work. Uh, Marcia Sen, as you may know, I don't know if you know this from your other classes, but Marcia Sen was the primary influence behind the UN's effort to redefine human development and the development of a human development index by the UN. Huh? If you look at the UN websites today, the measure of development adopted by the United Nations is the Human Development Index, and Amartya Sen was the main intellectual source and inspiration behind that. And the Human Development Index went way beyond you know, previous understandings of development, because in previous understandings, it was GDP growth, basically. It was a bit of a reductionist kind of idea. You know, if there's GDP growth, there's development. Huh? If there's industrialization, there's development. Huh? And in the Human Development Index, that's not what it's all about. It's all about building human capabilities. And we're going to have to discuss what that means, building human capabilities, education, health, all kinds of other capabilities, access to certain kinds of baskets of public goods. The other theorist, major theorist, that I believe you're going to be concentrating on this morning is Martha Nussbaum, whose text I believe you might have read. 
I hope you have read. And, and uh, Martha Nussbaum elaborated on and developed and expanded upon, I think significantly expanded upon, uh, uh, Amartya Sen's approach as far as the capabilities approach is concerned. What I'm, what I'm suggesting here is the capabilities approach of both Sen and Nussbaum is a way to move from the abstract to the actual implementation of subtle implementation of cosmopolitan ideals that are not an impossible utopia, but a realistic utopia in the sense that that is actually realizable, actually realizable. So, so it's an important discussion. I think it's an important discussion that you really need to know about. And I'm very pleased that you will be talking about this this morning. So the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me again. And, um Thank you for that introduction because it's precisely what I wanted to talk about. What usually the questions um, after we speak about cosmopolitanism come to be, it's like, okay, but how we, how do we do this? What are the tools? Uh, what, how do we make it less abstract um, and not just a normative aim? Um, and in the last class, we talked about a little bit. Um, just going to remind us uh, all of the importance that we kind of concluded on of this idea that there is a difference between justice and uh, injustice and misfortune. Um, and why I'm saying this today um, it will be clearer through the capabilities approach. Uh, Professor Golub gave an example of if there's an earthquake and the buildings that suffer the most are the buildings in, that are poorly constructed in poorer neighborhoods. We see an immediate link between an injustice and a misfortune, misfortune being the earthquake, but then the injustice is linked to the misfortune, which is very, very often the case even um, with natural occurring uh, misfortunes. So the capabilities approach is precisely this kind of tool that can uh, address and make clear uh, these kinds of instances where in situations that we have uh, misfortunes that are inevitable that are due to human vulnerability, the vulnerability of the planet we all inhabit, we can have a set of tools to protect us. Um, so we've mentioned that and we also talked about why it is, it, is it better maybe, uh, I, I believe personally uh, in my work that I've come to this conclusion that it's better to protect from harm than protect a vague notion of happiness or the pursuit of happiness that is in uh, the American Constitution. And now there's a tendency to put the capabilities approach in constitutions. Um, and this idea that if it's constitutionalized, which is what Martha Nussbaum aims for, then the people can uh, demand it from the government. Uh, so it becomes a part of the social construct, uh, contract. Um, and Amartya Sen was also very well known uh, for his contribution to healthcare, where he did a study of uh, countries that didn't have a social security system of healthcare accessible to all, and those who did. And in the countries where we do have a system, we talk about the cost of it. Uh, and then in those that we don't, we also talk about the cost of not having it. So what is interesting, and he came to show that uh, no matter the cost of the, um, the budget for healthcare and the uh, equally accessible social system, it, it is a far lesser cost than not having it, with all the far-reaching consequences of not having equal access to uh, basic needs such as uh, healthcare. So uh, in many ways, maybe they're not uh, put together, uh, all these tools that cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism uses, but in many ways they're um, coming to be more present and more concrete. Maybe they're not unified, maybe that is the reason why we have difficulty talking about them today. Uh, and also because what we've already mentioned, there is no uh, state sovereign, there is no way of imposing this in a complete way on um, on every national sovereign and in, 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 on in the international scene. But what is interesting to note what Professor Golub said about the United Nations, that is inspired by um, Amartya Sen's work. It's also the case for the OECD, for example. OECD now measures um, quality of life and quality of uh, and development of a country through the capabilities approach. And this is precisely this uh, conversation we've had uh, between just measuring GDP and saying a country does well because the GDP uh, shows that the country is doing well, is that sufficient? Is it really the equivalent of the individual happiness of the, in, uh, of the people in society? So the theoretical framework of moral cosmopolitanism is then uh, very visible and clear through the capabilities approach, which is, as Professor Golub said, probably their most, the most powerful tool or the most far-reaching and um, 
um, over-encompassing uh, cosmopolitanism has uh, had so far. Um, I want to read a quote by uh, David Held that I think is also in your syllabus uh, to start off the class. So the contemporary world is one in which we need to reinvent the idea of democracy, not surrender it. The project of cosmopolitan democracy involving the deepening of democracy within nation states and extending it across political borders is neither optimistic nor pessimistic with respect to these developments. It's just a position of advocacy. So why I think this is important to note is um, whatever our stance is on uh, the importance of nation states or the or if we believe we are in a sort of post-national uh, kind of era, uh, this idea of cosmopolitan democracies uh, is no longer just a vague uh, ideal because we have so many ways in which we are intertwined already on the uh, international scene, whether it be international ratifications, economic agreements, markets, uh, the movement of people. So it, it's become evident uh, that there needs to be more and more f uh, framework addressing this, addressing cosmopolitanism in a, in a more concrete way uh, as a necessary response to a globalized world order. Uh, so to get back to the capabilities approach. When it, uh, Amartya Sen uh, came up with it in the first place, it, it had uh, five components in his approach of assessing what capabilities were. Nowadays, there, uh, there's this idea between the basic capabilities and the more complex one, the basics being necessary um, to even talk about uh, the others, and Martin Nussbaum has expanded them to ten. Maybe I'll write some of it for you. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Initially, Sen argued for five. These were the importance of real freedoms in the assessment of a person's advantage. The second one reads, individual differences in the ability to transform resources into valuable activities. The third, the multivariate nature of activities giving rise to happiness. And four, a balance of materialistic and non-materialistic factors in evaluating human welfare. And five, concerns for the distribution of opportunities within society. So I can summarize them or read them again. So Sen starts with five. Real freedoms. In the assessments of a person's identity. Individual differences in the ability to transform resources into valuable activities. The multivariate nature of activities giving rise to happiness. Now that's an interesting one that we kind of already talked about in the last class. Uh, what, what, innate, what gives rise to happiness? And what is happiness? So I think that is the reason why he states the multivariate nature, that depending on context, age, culture, needs, uh, it might be a very different set uh, of tools required to achieve that. And four, a balance of materialistic and non-materialistic factors in evaluating human welfare. So if we take, for example, the ability to transform resources into valuable activities, um, one of the examples Sen also uses is um, making bicycles accessible to everyone, making the usage of bicycles accessible to everyone also uh, is beneficial for the environment, is beneficial for human health. But then how can a person who doesn't have the same bodily abil uh, able abilities to use uh, a bicycle benefit from this and transform these resources? That is uh, the question that uh, becomes, uh, 
evident why he formulates it as the ability to transform the resources. So giving everybody a bicycle doesn't enable everybody. If somebody has a handicap, recently I um, worked with someone who does precisely this uh, for people that have different, bo di different bodily abilities. Uh, for example, adapting a bicycle to somebody who has an impairment in, in one of their arms. That would be the ability to transform resources. Now it becomes obvious that not every country, not every government can provide uh, such situations and that would be a real way of measuring what a government does uh, for people who have different vulnerabilities. Uh, this one we, we mentioned in a way that it's difficult and complicated uh, and vague to determine what happiness is, so therefore we give a multivariate nature to it and uh, it, it becomes more of an individual assessment of happiness. And the materialistic and non-materialistic uh, factors, and the last one is the concern for distribution. So, mm -hmm. concern for the distribution of opportunities within society. Then, before uh, coming to the five um, capabilities approach, he was first focused just on the healthcare system and how do we come to assess a healthcare system in, within a given country. And he talked about uh, this idea that um, we, we have to uh, make it more inclusive for anybody who has an unequal exposure to risk, which is something we also mentioned uh, last time in class, that we are all exposed to the risk of vulnerability, uh, illness, old age, uh, certain natural disasters, but then there are people who are in an unequal way exposed to risk, whether it be because of precarity uh, or um, a born um, a handicap that they, that they are born with or that, that they come to acquire it through life, any form of dependency. So instead of, uh, like for example in France, uh, you have senior homes, you have uh, a certain way of grouping the most vulnerable together, also the handicapped. This approach would help go into a more individualistic approach, helping the person where they live to have the resources they need to uh, not have to be uh, placed somewhere else or in different circumstances in order to be able to fully develop their life as other individuals in society can. So it started from a, a, an approach to healthcare and then subsequently with two other economists, their names are a development economist, Sudhir Anand, and a theorist, uh, James Foster. They made the capabilities approach uh, a sort of paradigm for policy debate in human development, and that's where it inspired the creation of the United Nations Human Development Index. So the human... United Nations Human... traditional way of measuring. So this is a popular measure of human development that, cap that captures the capabilities but only in the, um, in the health uh, department and has now been enlarged to education and income as well. Uh, in addition, this approach has been operationalized with a high income country focus um, in order to uh, understand how income is uh, used, what people prioritize. and. Um, so this, uh, this is what started off the capabilities approach, and then it has been much discussed by philosophers, by uh, economists. Uh, Martha Sen is also a philosopher. Uh, and Martha Nussbaum has become maybe the most prominent advocate uh, recently for it, with the idea of the importance of constitutionalizing. For example, in the first report regarding the approach to healthcare that Amartya Sen uh, wrote, uh, there is a statement that says something like this, um, I'm paraphrasing it, uh, that everybody has the right to an environment that enables health, that is uh, conductive of human health and well-being, but we don't really know what that environment is. How do we know if we are living in circumstances where we are exposed to pollution if we don't have uh, information about it uh, and what do we do about it if we are aware of it so that's why Martin Nussbaum ins insists on the idea if it's constitutionalized it's part of the social con contract and uh, it enables citizens to ask their governments for it 
So the the approach that Nussbaum has is in a way more philosophically pure, but Sands is more concrete and applicable. These were the main remarks given. Uh, and then what is interesting that they united to elaborate them on three different levels as the basic and the more advanced capabilities. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, this all is, of course, in uh, the line of thought that we always talk about in this class of living the good life, the pursuit of happiness, just institutions, how do we make this feasible, how do we make uh, institutions accountable. Uh, so the idea of constitutionalizing it comes from Nussbaum and uh, holding governments accountable. Uh, this uh, capabilities approach is uh, probably the most important uh, approach that we have nowadays to um, to focus on moral significance of individuals when we talk about protecting individuals because we all have an inherent moral worth and uh, we are uh, equals in human dignity, which is all the topics we've uh, to uh, mentioned in last class. Uh, it still is a vague uh, idea uh, to protect human dignity and what is human dignity. And then again, I come back to what we talked about last time, that it's much easier to uh, have an agreement on how we minimize the harm, how we minimize exposure to risk, and uh, to come together in an agreement on what harm is. So well-being for them... Uh, has no single measure and is not imposable on others. Its elements are many and do not boil down to just pure utility. The capability approach is a theoretical framework that entails two core normative claims. So the first one is that the freedom to achieve well-being is of primary moral importance. And second, that freedom to achieve well-being is to be understood in terms of people's capabilities. I think these two, um, no, these two claims nuance what we talk about. Uh, we still acknowledge the idea of human freedom and well-being, but we do it in a more concrete way by saying that it's dependent on uh, individual capabilities to achieve so. So the real opportunities uh, that we have uh, to, uh, to establish a life we have reason to value. So this approach has led to a new, uh, a new body of literature that is highly interdisciplinary. It's in, of course in social sciences, but not only because it now mixes new statistics and social indicators, no longer just measuring GDP per capita, uh, with ideas of new policy paradigms that philosophers or sociologists um, call uh, the human development approach. Index is a part of the human development approach. Uh, we didn't write the year. The first time the capabilities approach was articulated by Sam was in the 80s. And uh, the, it, it re helped redefine also a lot of no notions that we use in philosophy. One of them is, for example, poverty. Uh, here in the capabilities approach, poverty is understood as deprivation in the capability to live a good life and also redefine de development as an uh, understanding of an, uh, the ability to expand one's capabilities. So the development isn't only on the state level, it's the ability to uh, expand capabilities. So revisiting notions such as poverty. So the capabilities uh, approach becomes a concrete tool to evaluate um, individual well-being within countries, but it also becomes a tool for moral evaluation of social arrangements within a country and uh, a way of, for hol holding countries accountable for the well-being of its citizens. Uh, so we see that now something that had a normative aim of providing um, a theory of moral cosmopolitanism has also a ways of implementing it and imposing it. And the most influential uh, version of the philosophical interpretation of it um, that relates to also the quality of life, but something uh, categorized in the terms of functionings and capabilities, 
uh, is uh, the starting point of what I was telling you earlier about what it means to possess a bike and to be able to do s to use uh, s the bike towards one's well-being. So functionings are states of being and doing, such as being well nourished, uh, having shelter, and they should be distinguished from the commodities employed to achieve them. As a bicycle, as a bicycle is distinguishable from p possessing and using a bicycle. The capabilities, on the other hand, refer to the set of valuable functionings that a person has effective access to. Thus, a person's uh, capability represents the effective freedom of an individual to choose between different functioning combinations, between different kinds of life, that she has reason to value. Instead of a single capability set, and this is also common in the wider capability literature, this allows analysis to focus on sets of functionings related to particular aspects of life, for example, the capabilities of literacy, health, or political freedom. So there's a, Sen always insists and points out to the heterogeneity in people's abilities to convert the same bundle of resources into valuable functionings. The, the reason why Sen uh, points to this, uh, the, to the importance of the ability to convert the same bundle of resources into valuable functionings, is this idea that um, he is in a way his own critic by saying that there is never a fixed set um, of capabilities. Uh, it, it will always be dependent on the context, on the culture. Uh, and the, the reason for saying that is uh, to enable a life for the capabilities approach in the sense of uh, being able to adjust to circumstances in a different country, being able to adjust to changing times, uh, and allowing that their uh, interpretation be as free as possible, which is um, a w also a way he criticizes constitutions, where he says that um, many of uh, our constitutions, if they were to be reinterpreted um, regarding the context we live in, they would enable for more or less, or they would point out to a need to change certain things. So evaluating and reevaluating the capabilities approach through international institutions like the OECD or uh, inter in an interdisciplinary way with colleagues um, is what uh, Sen is open to and uh, invites his colleagues to do and what he, what he did with Martin Nussbaum. Uh, so this uh, variation in the abilities of different members of society to utilize the same uh, resources is of extreme importance to him. But that comes second as a more complex capabilities. Uh, they both agree on starting off with the basic capabilities that could be maybe summed up in one word as access. So if we make sure that there is an equal access to healthcare, to education, to shelter, then we can talk about how we transform the basic capabilities into complex capabilities that enable well-being, that enable a life uh, one judge is worth living. So in uh, addition to what we talked about in this class about the idea of moral cosmopolitanism, this could also be considered as a very concrete and political form of cos cosmopolitanism because uh, it's a critique that is supranational, transnational of states, um, of the way the individual within the state is treated, and a critique that enables uh, individuals to hold their states accountable and to improve uh, constitutions to improve uh, the well-being on the national level uh, and trying to unify it eventually uh, on the international scene. Uh, some countries have already, uh, um, I think it's Finland who was the first one uh, to constitutionalize the capabilities approach um, and um, to grasp uh, the, the, the importance of uh, measuring the well-being within the country through it. So just to make sure before I switch to Nussbaum. Yes, uh, and then there's something important maybe to be said about the theories of justice and their relation to the capabilities approach. Mm -hmm. uh, have you talked about rules? Uh, 
Rawls, yes. Okay, so you, you, you're familiar with the theories of justice and how we come about a just society, the veil of ignorance, this supposed idea that we won't know what category we fall into society and that is the most just way um, to choose the society we want to inhabit and how we want it organized. The way I presented that was that if you don't know if you're going to end up as a frog or a lion, you better have a just constitution. You better have good terms of living for frogs. Yes. <laughs> uh, so this is in the, um, in the, for example, there are three ways we could divide ethics today. We could be those that um, are goal-oriented, that say that whatever the result of uh, the ethical decision is what matters, those that are oriented in a deontological kind of way that say that uh, action itself, if it's ethical, is what matters, and then the um, virtue ethics, which maybe I've mentioned last time, uh, which can be found in, Aris found in Aristotle, which is this idea that uh, we ameliorate the human being and life by uh, doing it through a certain virtue. It was most notably the idea of sagacité or what would be sagacité and prudence uh, or happiness or empathy or compassion. Um, and the way that these ethics and, theory, and the idea of theory of justice uh, relates to the capabilities approach is because the capabilities approach is in a way a theological and a deontological approach. The theo theological aim of the capabilities approach is this moral cosmopolitanism, the, the protection of every human being uh, and the enabling of the good life. And the way of coming about, the deontological way, is by enshrining um, five or ten, we'll see, or making it constitutional, um, arguing uh, that a theory of justice based on fairness should be directly and deeply concerned with the effect of freedom or the capability of actual people to achieve the lives they have reason to value. Now, let me switch to how Nussbaum expanded them. Uh, so her focus was to take uh, what Sen was proposing and to design a just constitution with these capabilities. So she proposes a list of ten central human capabilities. So this was Sen's for Rome. We are talking about Rome. No, we're moving, we've moved now from Sen to Nussbaum. Oh. No, I was just mentioning John Rawls. Uh, if you mentioned him already in the class when you were talking about how do we come about, uh, how, do, how do we have just society? So John Rawls, he says, in order to create a society, we need to be completely oblivious of the role we will have in the society, uh, whether we will be able-bodied, handicapped, black, white, male, female. And that is the only way to assure uh, that this will be a just society that will pr provide equal capabilities to all. So since that is the hypothetical um, experiment that we cannot do, we are already in society. The capabilities approach is in a way a theory of justice with what we have, ensuring that everybody has an access to something that they can use as a tool to develop their own, uh, the life that they, uh, that they deem worthy, uh, valuable of living. So those are the five that Sen starts off with and then those found they're very brief, they're basically just words, I'll explain them in a second. In a second. So, first is life, second is bodily health. Bodily integrity. The senses. And within them, imagination and thought. The fifth is emotions. Practical reason. And then I'll just 
identified other species, this one refers to other living beings. So, so she clearly sees her work as providing uh, citizens with a justification and arguments uh, for constitutional principles that citizens have a right to demand from their governments. So to have a right to demand, for example, control over one's environment is an interesting thing to think, think about today. Um, or her work, uh, number four, senses, uh, imagination, and thought. That one is something I've particularly worked on in uh, my thesis. She is also um, a prominent thinker in uh, the role of uh, emotions in politics and how do we use certain pro-social emotions uh, to develop more inclusive societies. Uh, and th the work on imagination and thought is interesting because she insists on, this is also something that Sen studied in uh, his first approach to healthcare, where in uh, medical school in the UK and in one university in the US, I think it was Yale, they had uh, imposed an art class to medical students for a year. They would have them paint, express themselves through painting. Uh, and no matter how good or not good at it they were, what they tried to measure is that expressing yourself through art helped better empathize with uh, patients and actually be better even in the diagnostic uh, department uh, in, in setting diagnosis. So the idea is that when we care about someone, we will perform better our professional duty, whatever that is, this is just an example from uh, medicine. And how do we do that? How do we go about expanding this idea um, of the other, expanding the imaginary? Uh, Nussbaum insists it's through expressing senses uh, in different ways and through uh, education in the arts and literature. So, for example, once you've seen a movie or read a book uh, depicting um, certain circumstances that maybe you will never live through, that you never even talked about, thought about. Your imaginary in this way expands that you are better armed to address the situation when it arises in real life. That this kind of education uh, is what provides a form of moral cosmopolitanism, which provides a way of seeing the world through the other's eyes, and um, is a big core part of her work, I would say. So. The order, you can look into it more. I don't know how much time I have, if I have time to go into detail. Yeah, I think it would be good if you detailed it a little bit. Okay. Actually. So in her most recent uh, publications, she has uh, detailed, uh, she has had a lot of critique uh, to face whether there is an actual order to this. Um, adding other species also to the social contract is very uh, interesting and, um, and original. So the idea of protecting first and foremost human life, of course, comes from what we already know uh, from all the formulations of uh, the uh, human rights. So we've talked about in the last class uh, uh, the difference between the rights of the citizen and human rights. And human rights, uh, we've seen when a country doesn't, does no longer provide protection of, uh, to the citizen or once somebody is no longer a citizen, the human rights are often seen as just the basic minimum to protect human life and human dignity. So that is why her starting point is life. Uh, not leaving any life as bare life without protection. The notion of bare life we've also mentioned in last class when we talked about Giorgio Angamben. Judith Butler also uses it. This is this idea of a life that has uh, no social function, no protection, just in a biological sense, life, existence. Um, and we've seen the dangers of rendering life as such. Once life is just bare life with no protection, what happens to any risks and dangers to that life? Uh, and how even killing life that is bare life ends up being in a situation of impunity because there is no protection, no, uh, defi no social definition to this life. So her first aim is to avoid um, putting any life in the situation of bare life. Bodily health and bodily integrity, maybe it's evident, uh, is bodily health is related to access to health care, which Sen elaborated. Bodily integrity, there's a lot of her work also uh, done uh, to counter all sorts of gruesome forms of mutilation practices that go against the integrity of human body, of uh, bodily integrity, senses I've already mentioned. 
And Emotions is also interesting. Uh, she wrote a book called uh, Why Love Matters for Justice or the Upheaval of Emotions, where she addresses, uh, just to sum it up quickly, uh, how the ways in which we are governed also enable or don't uh, certain emotions, enable us to express in a certain way, to be more empathetic towards the other, more compassionate, to act more in solidarity, uh, or uh, do they, or or do they, do certain societies impose this ideal of the individual who focuses only on him or herself, without um, acting in solidarity with others? So she believes that the route to solidarity and societies that are um, uh, that act in solidarity lies in emotions and the way we uh, we promote them. Uh, there is also um, a little collection that I encourage you to read that's called. Um, for love of country and uh, there are eight or nine articles one of them is by Appiah that we've already mentioned in this class Kwame Anthony Appiah a philosopher, a cosmopolitan as well uh, where they talk about um, the successful mobilization of emotions that have empowered uh, states that have empowered national sovereignty that have uh, given us uh, the idea of patriotism and how do we come about today in this globalized world order to have a sort of compassionate patriotism, a moral cosmopolitanism, patriotism uh, that um, surpasses the nation. Uh, practical reason and affiliation both, rela both in a way relate to education. Uh, practical reason having access not only to education but uh, access to information through media that's not biased or having access to multiple sources of media. This is a critique she did um, on uh, how certain countries by tailoring information they give uh, to citizens enable a sort of um, enable uh, disable the citizens from uh, coming up with their own uh, reasoning uh, of a certain situation, affiliation as well, to be able to belong or not to belong to a certain party, uh, play, the importance of uh, leisure and, okay, I don't think I need to say more about that, control over one's environment I've already mentioned. This is maybe important, even more important today as we talk about uh, the, anthrop the Anthropocene as the geological age that we're now in, th that it's obvious in uh, all the numerous waves, ways we've affected uh, nature and how it now turns to affect human health. One of the um, very important and original contributions that the capabilities approach has today is precisely in showing the link between the environment and human health. Uh, so making it more um, concrete and again giving us a tool for in which we can um, do something about it. Um, yes. So uh, the last one would be. Uh, honestly, I haven't uh, read much on the last one, but it's uh, the la question animal, the animal cause. How do we protect uh, all uh, all living species, and how do we pre uh, prevent unnecessary harm? Because there's a part of her work that also says that. Um, if there is harm imposed to other living creatures and we just consent to it, can we really live a moral, ethical life? How does that uh, influence um, the, the ethical well-being or stance of individuals? So that would be the, the Nussbaum's, Nussbaum's 10 uh, capabilities. We had a debate in, in this class uh, among the students and among ourselves on animal rights. Oh, you did? Yes, we did. Which were the uh, authors, or was it? Uh, Singer, Peter Singer, oh. and others. Okay, so maybe you, you are better informed than on point 10. I'll look into it more. Uh, so the, these uh, capabilities, basic cap capabilities and general comp capabilities, can uh, later be transformed by each and every individual. And in my opinion, they are the strongest tools moral cosmopolitanism has uh, today to help uh, rank living standards throughout the globe, uh, to help hold countries accountable and um, protect um, human dignity in a way that addresses human dignity in a more concrete way. Uh, way I mentioned a, a critique last time I was here um, by uh, an Italian philosopher uh, who published a, a book, Humanity Without Dignity, to try and address the question of humanity and its protection without the necessarily going through the idea of human dignity. 
And um, this is again uh, what uh, the capabilities approach enables us to do uh, by saying that we agree on what harm is. We can see uh, through all of the capabilities I've mentioned what would be their opposite, what would be the risk to human health, what would be exposure to violence, to cruelty, uh, slavery, any forms of um, violence that would go against bodily health, bodily integrity, the expression of emotions, senses, control over one's environment. Those uh, are the conditions that Martin Nussbaum and Sen are agreed upon, that it's much easier to agree on what harm is and how we go about avoiding it than agreeing on what the pursuit of happiness is and what happiness is for every individual. That was even in the 80s in the beginning of Sen's work when he says that it matters what gives rise to happiness, not to define happiness for all. Did you have any questions? Would you like me? Let me see what I want. You see what this picture, um, before we, we can open up the discussion, but what this picture does, if you think about, if you think about uh, the translation of this into, into, for instance, do economic theory, if there is a possible translation of this, if the, 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 the way our societies have been dominated now for a very long time, with the idea of individualized competition, atomistic competition. It's an issue I come back to regularly in this class. Huh? Atomistic competition in which, in which the, the, the aims and strivings of the societies to become, quote, unquote, more competitive. Huh? Or, or that individuals have to be, have to be autonomous, but not in the sense of morally autonomous, but autonomous in the sense that they, that, that, that they, they have to be engaged in an autonomous life vis-a-vis -vis of others, that they're in struggle vis-a-vis -vis of others. Not autonomy defined as the ability to be with others, with dignity, but rather autonomy defined as part of an atomistic relationship of potential conflict and competition and rivalry with others. So if you take this conception, you take the conception, which would be what, it, what I've just described as neoliberalism, huh? the philosophical underpinning of neoliberalism, that our aims in life, that human beings, Homo economicus, the, the foundational idea of neoclassical or neoliberal economic theory, homo economicus, they were, we are rationally driven to maximize our profit. It's a very poor, impoverished understanding of what human beings are. No? It's not only morally poor, it's aesthetically poor. <laughs> It's aesthetically poor in the sense that it flattens out the world, it flattens out what it means to be human in the sense of, as, in, as humans in society, what makes humans specifically human? Hmm? Which doesn't mean that other, other non-human animals need to be treated but, uh, without care. But what makes humans specifically human? What is, what is it that, this question of dignity that's been raised in a, a couple of times in in, in, in Zona's talk, what, what, what is it that we have to actually defend, defend as, a, as a, both a, a moral, ethical, and a political need? What do we need to defend? When you were in Lesbos and you saw bare life, you saw bare life. You see, Angamen's notion of bare life, of human beings, bare life means what it means, human beings stripped down to survival. Where they're, where they're no longer in a position where, the, where the, the, those people, those individuals, are no longer in a position to even begin to think any of this. You see, so between bare life and, and neoliberalism, there's a link in the sense that it's the idea that, that, that ultimately our purposes in life, what are the purposes, what are our purposes in life? If our purpose is only homo economicus, economic competition, and that the ultimate rationality of our being is located in that, then none of this becomes even remotely thinkable. Huh? What this does is it creates a complex and layered understanding of what it means to actually achieve, in a constitutionalized setting, what it means to achieve our humanity. To achieve it. To make it possible. And it's not moralism, huh? It's not moralism. 
I'm not saying this is right and that is wrong. Yeah. Maybe an interesting yeah. example to depict how it's not moralism or how it's not setting a hierarchical importance on these things is what Aaron, Hannah Arendt wrote in the 30s and that's still so relevant today when she says we only become aware of all of this, of this right, this access to all of this once other people who have lost all of these rights to have rights uh, all of these rights and just the idea of the right to have rights, which is her formulation, appear. When we have the appearance of uh, uh, refugees that have gotten stuck, in literally stuck in situations of, of no man's land, of no protection, no international system, no country protecting them, bare life left to die, literally and socially, we become aware of having all of these and their importance and their significance. So the idea of the right to have rights is also a, a, a way, maybe a lens to look at the capabilities approach. That they enable the understanding that without this, and also what Professor Gold is saying, we, we are not uh, made to live just for the accumulation of our own goods because there is no life that could be made out of society, out of a community. So if living, this is also the idea of the good life that Paul Ricoeur um, theorizes, if living a good life within a bad life is possible, which is, I think, an interesting way to think of it. If we live our own little protected good life, knowing that there are people who live without all of this that we come to take for granted and normal, how can the capabilities approach help us think that it is necessary to protect it on an international level, not just for our own community, our own society on the national level? Gabriel. Um, it's interesting to go against the uh, kind of neoliberal, uh, homo economicus uh, mm -hmm. approach. You know, when you see people who are in this fair life situation, if it was the case that our ultimate goal is to maximize our profits, then you would rationally see people trying to, you know, gain economic uh, wealth um, in this fair life situation. But what, at least I observe, is that people are focusing on uh, one, gaining uh, resources which they can then transform into other things that would give rise to happiness. Um, and then they're also focusing on their own bodily and mental health, bodily integrity, and protecting you know, their children and their families. Um, and, and more focusing on things that will give them joy and happiness and comfort rather than just sheer economic. Yes. That's that's an interesting. Uh, yes, I agree. And also, as a critique of the neoliberal ideal that you mentioned, there is also uh, how do we explain the rise of populism? How do we explain the rise of far right movements? This need to belong to something other than this individual that's focused only on the accumulation of goods, or also the needs of those who cannot fit into that ideal. Uh, and there is a lot of also study on uh, how this ideal has impacted health, not just bodily, but also in the sense of mental health of individuals and the level of happiness. We systematically um, test uh, countries that are considered to be highly developed against underdeveloped countries when testing happiness. And there is no concrete link uh, in um, uh, the acquisition of goods and happiness. Uh, there is actually a lot of stress involved in attaining this ideal that's just an ideal that, that cannot be accomplished by anyone of the autonomous, independent individual, uh, because everybody is dependent in a visible or a less visible way at any given point of life. But this extreme dependency that we talk about, that you mentioned as well, and in, is also an interesting way to look at it, even in the situations of extreme dependencies, what is the, the aim thing, the main thing people aim for? So you mentioned that uh, Martha Nussbaum uh, wishes uh, the capabilities approach to be constitutionalized. Uh, so I was wondering if there has been any legal attempt to do so. I know that in Finland it has already been done and there is one more country I have to check. And it's something that the OECD uh, has already implemented and tries to bring countries to the table to talk about this uh, as a... Um, as a suggestion, a suggestion for constitutionalizing it. And this is the idea, like for example, in the US Constitution you have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Life and liberty is already important, but the pursuit of happiness 
has been uh, theorized and criticized a lot as this idea that, that, that ends up not protecting anything at all because we don't agree on what happiness is. So uh, that is the idea behind uh, bringing countries to the table to try and constitutionalize the capabilities approach, to making it more concrete, something that citizens can ask for. Because it's hard to ask for your own personal happiness if it could be very different from individual to individual, where it's a lot more concrete and sustainable to ask for control over environment, bodily integrity, access to health care. So, uh, so I was just, uh, my concern is that uh, I think, as you mentioned, happiness can have a different uh, definition for each person, each culture. So I was just wondering if Nussbaum's wishes to apply the same condition for all constitutions or she's for modification of the theory uh, according to, or depending on, on different uh, countries, cultures? Um, well, this is the way we interpret, the, that's what they both agree on, that it wouldn't be any kind of imposition of, I don't think there would be any disagreement what bodily integrity is, that there would be somebody who could say, I can do without that. So the idea is what we cannot do without and then you can interpret it in different ways, the need to express certain emotions or what play is for you or what a healthy environment is. But as long as it protects the, the what actually would prevent bare life, as long as it protects what keeps a, a human life with a social function livable and enabled, it doesn't, um, at least I, I haven't seen a critique um, for the capabilities approach to talk about that, it isn't limiting in any way. It's a very uh, open path. I think it would be hard to find any particular culture. I'm not talking about political culture here. I'm talking about culture in the sense of the, the deeply rooted historical traditions of a country and the shared uh, significations produced in a particular culture. A culture that would be, that would not be in a position to integrate these 10 capabilities, because they're framed precisely in such a way as to be possibly, potentially transcultural. Mm -hmm. I mean, this can apply, I think, as well. If you take religious traditions to, to, to uh, Confucianism, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. There's nothing here which asserts uh, the, the, the primacy of the idea of the autonomous Western individual, rash, rational Western individual. Huh? It does something quite different. It has a quite different function. And that function, that function is precisely to be able to adapt these core capabilities everywhere. Because these are the core capabilities that Nussbaum, I think quite correctly, perhaps one could add to it, but uh, quite correctly defines as the, the conditions of possibility for fulfilling one's humanity, irrespective of your culture of the specific characteristics of your culture. You can believe in this God or that God, or this spirit or that spirit, whatever, but you can still concur, I think, maybe we can discuss that, on these 10 points, which once they become constitutionalized, become rights, and once they become rights, they become the means, it's what <coughs> As uh, Zonazaric said, once they become rights, they become the means through which citizens become empowered to demand them and to demand that these rights then be constantly granted by the state because the state's own legitimacy is founded then on this. Of course, it implies a certain kind of egalitarianism, huh? I mean, the substratum here is a certain kind of both moral as well as uh, implicitly material egalitarianism. The basket of goods, all, all people must have access to the basket of goods, symbolic and material, that make this possible. And I wanted to add something that also maybe even makes it urgent, is um, 
certain scientific and technological improvements if we look at them through the lens of bioethics. Uh, for example, UNESCO does something where it tries to bring um, all countries to the table to talk about bioethics, saying that if there are many things we can disagree on because of different cultures, different religious uh, views, there is uh, bioethics in the sense of the way we protect life, what life is, extensions such as transhumanistic uh, approaches to life. Uh, we have to address this question because this is a question that concerns us all, no matter the, the, the approach. And then why the capabilities approach, in my opinion, is important there. If we have gene editing arise in China, if we have uh, legalized euthanasia in Switzerland, but not in France, it is obvious that nowadays, because of a globalized world, because of a, already a form of cosmopolitanism, just in the sense of free movement of markets and goods, uh, a citizen of a country that doesn't provide legal euthanasia can go and get that right in another country, or gene editing, or um, assisted procreation for uh, homosexual couples. It is a question that every country needs to address because the solution isn't in that country just letting its citizens find solutions elsewhere. It obviously this this trend obviously shows a need that every country needs to address. So. Um, this, there is a committee in France and in other countries, which is the Ethics Committee, uh, National Ethics Committee, that, that talks about these questions that has noticed a trend um, in, um, uh, in uh, lesbian couples who, or single mothers who wanted to have children and didn't have the same means to accomplish that in France, were going to either Belgium or Switzerland and obtaining what they wanted and needed. So the, the Comité National d'Éthique, the French uh, National Ethics Committee, is now trying to address uh, this question and uh, to come up with a solution, and it has enabled, regardless of relationship status or sexuality, whether homosexual or heterosexual or single parent or single mothers, to do so. And now it opens up another argument, which is often called a slippery slo uh, slope argument, which is this idea that then uh, homosexual men, uh, male couples, could ask for the same thing. But in their case, it would no longer be that one of them would parent. They would need to uh, have uh, what the French call gestation par autrui, which means that somebody else uh, carries that child. And in France, it is systematically, uh, France is systematically against uh, any kind of uh, putting a value or price on the human body, which, for example, in the U.S., I've heard a popular term that's actually terrible, funny and terrible, called rentabelli, uh, where somebody else carries your child for a certain amount of money. France is against that, but now that it has enabled um, women, uh, homosexual couples, to have children, what will be... Uh, the response if uh, men, if male, uh, if gay couples ask for the same. So it's interesting to see how these questions end up concerning us all in the most developed, least developed countries, and thinking that we don't have to think about them will end up um, proving us wrong uh, through just the sheer uh, needs of people and the way they move when they want to obtain something. I really like that. Rent a belly, buy a foot, you know, I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> that does actually raise an interesting question about uh, bodily integrity. Because, uh, if you do have bodily integrity, technically you could consent to rent in your car. Yep. Or the question of organ donation is the same. For example, in France, it has to be free. That every French citizen's a uh, citizen after death becomes automatically an organ donor unless opt, uh, he or she opts out of the system. Whereas in the U.S., there is a fixed price on a kidney, for example. Um, there's no futures market yet. <laughs> but there's a kidney. <laughs> interesting question that puts national sovereignty in tension with this kind of cosmopolitan world order, where if you say that and you say, well, in China they can do it, I want to do it as well, but the country is against gene editing, doesn't have a, a, a clear context on a national level what, what their approach is to it. It's interesting to see. I, I know it, it has worked for maybe 
uh, more urgent uh, situations where, uh, I, I gave an example I think in your class last time, where a country is a signee of the CEDAW, which is the Convention of Elimination of All for Forms of Violence Against Women, which was a case of Tunis, but then on a national level doesn't allow women to ask for divorce. And then women said, well, if we've signed this ratification, the national sovereignty, the national law needs to change, and it did change. So I'm assuming in some distant future it could be um, a topic we have also around gene editing, if it becomes a norm on an international level. And, and biochip insertions. <coughs> Can you imagine the effects of that? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm being facetious and banal. That, you know, you could, of course, have a biochip that has the complete works of Shakespeare, but when you insert it in your little port, suddenly you have access to this absolutely extraordinary language that fills your mind, you know? But it could also have other contents, right? Virus. Virus, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Do you see anything that would be lacking from Ms. Bond's list? Good question. I don't want to sound like the biggest fan, um, which I probably am of her work, but I, um, I thought about it actually. Do you see something? No, well, I mean, I kind of given enough thought to it. Is what? Cosmopolitan theory. Yes. I think the main element is the peace. There's nothing about peace uh -huh. in the world. Peace at home in the world. Because it's an individual approach. It's an approach just uh, literally individual, tailored towards protecting every individual's life and dignity. Um, the, it's interesting that you raise that question because, yes, cosmopolitanism, moral cosmopolitanism is all about. Uh, organizing the world order in a way, since we have social contracts on national levels, uh, what do we do in the international scene? Uh, and of course, aiming for peace. You've read here perpetual peace, Kant, and how do we come to organize ourselves in that context is a part of the work that most cosmopolitanism does. But uh, the capabilities approach is a very individual uh, oriented and tailored approach. And it also isn't um, disconnected from your question because it assumes that if we provide individuals with these means, that that would lead to greater peace and stability in the world. Yeah, there's an underlying assumption there. It's, it's not explicit. In Sen's work, for instance, there's an underlying assumption, of course, that, that human development defined as both his complex list and as his preliminary list actually would create the conditions, if fulfilled, for more peaceful societies, including in their interactions among each other. In that way, we could look at what we talked about in last class and Kant's perpetual peace and the second, uh, the third definitive article on hospitality, a sort of um, larger approach uh, or a state approach. And this capabilities approach is the individual individual approach, and in that way, it could complement each other. I mean, I was not. I mean, this is not designed to solve everything. Anyway, please go ahead. I was not only referring to to international peace, but also national. Oh, in in, in domestic. Yeah. So, you know, like class struggle or mm -hmm. economic yes, advantages yes, yes. of people, any kind of peace. I mean, yeah, if, if I there's one like thing that I think is lacking here, is there's. A, there's an insufficient, I think it's more in Sen than in, than in Nussbaum, in, at least in the list here, there's, there's an insufficient focus on the question of distributive justice, which is an important issue. I mean, it's the, in Sen, it's in yes, Sen, it's in Sen, in Sen more than in Nussbaum. Because distributive justice is, a, is, a very found, is foundational to social peace within the state. But Nussbaum believes that once this is constitutionalized, yes. then the country has to think about the distribution. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, it's a question of how you implement it. And if you, if you think of, of the various possibilities, I think your, your question is a good question, actually. And, uh, that's, since she wants this to be constitutionalized, is she for a referendum? Or how does she want this to be constitutionalized? Just uh, opting in. Hoping with that countries will opt. Well without people. 
Well, the parliament. One would suppose the parliament, right? Parliament. I, I, I don't know many people who would be against this, bodily health, life, bodily integrity, senses, emotions, practical reason, and so forth. Yeah, I mean, my question was in a legal perspective. Yeah. Was she for parliament, for parliament, I would suppose. Yeah, referendum. I mean, this doesn't solve everything, OK? There, there is no such thing as, as a philosophical framework that solves everything, unfortunately. If we had it, we wouldn't have most of the problems that we have. Um, if you think of the possible sources of conflict in society, within society, you have income distribution issues, you have uh, ethnic, ethnic conflicts, you have religious differentiations. We have all kinds of differentiations and segmentations and stratifications that are a constant source of tension. The, the idea here is how do you create something that approximates a just constitution, mm -hmm. that approximates a just constitution, that, that deals with, it can help to deal with all these segmentations, these stratifications, these sources of conflict and struggle. Huh? I mean, poverty is, you know, Sen, Sen, you know, Sen's whole work started from this, from this idea that, that, that poverty is itself a major source of conflict huh? and violence. Poverty itself, living in poverty, is, is, is to be subjected to a form of violence. The, the question you raise also makes me think about how every time we talk now about international uh, ratifications and national sovereignty, there's this idea that it's a tension, that it's something that um, international ratifications will also end up taking away something from the country, taking away from the sovereign. And we see a lot of populist discourse that goes around that and says, you know, the country first and protecting its citizens. We don't, we cannot address these questions because of budget, because of this and that. And it's seen usually anytime there is some sort of intervention towards moral cosmopolitanism as interventionism that a certain country no longer affords or because of moral reasons no one doesn't believe in, doesn't adhere to. This is maybe a way you mentioning the referendum made me think about it for countries to accept that this in no way um, impedes national sovereignty. It enriches it, but it also allows for an actual real international scene in which there would no longer be this unequal distribution when in one country there is one of these issues at stake people would be moving towards another, and then addressing the question of uh, immigration and a record number of people on the move through means that become more complicated and a bigger burden for everyone and a big greater danger, first and foremost, to those people, if already the country would provide basics that have nothing to do with sort of give or take, uh, giving away of sovereignty. It probably is one of the rare tools of cosmopolitanism that is very clear in the sense that there is no sovereignty uh, to, to give away to seed to the international scene. It's for domestic incorporation, for those who want, who seek. All right, I thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you all know that the 